failed to mention uh, that I am glad if you're welcome, if you're visiting for the first time, glad you're here this morning. I know somebody, Jim, said he has some grandchildren here this morning, right? Amen? Yeah? And their boyfriends, I think. Is that true? Yes? Now I'm meddling, aren't I? Nice to see you back there. Your grandchildren are a little older than mine. Mine are uh, like a little, about two and a half. Welcome this morning. All right. John chapter 20, if you have your Bible. If you happen to notice, and I'm sure you will, that my translation is a little different from what's on the screen, it's because I completely forgot my NIV at work. And uh, <clears throat> this is a Holman. I started using my dad's Bible. Uh, we were able to go through the house after he passed. And uh, BJ, his wife, had said, anything that you guys want. I'm always interested in books and the scriptures that he had, some extra scriptures. So it's just encouraging. I love to see that, you know, uh, one generation. Maybe some of you have a Bible like that or something like that that means something to you. You see where he's marked it up. But this is a Holman translation, just to say all that. Okay? I didn't mean to get off into the whole story here with you. Story time about the translations. John chapter 20. Starting in verse 19. John 20, verse 19. In the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered, gathered together with the doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. And then Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. Anybody need peace today? Peace. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You can see the little bit different word usage there. Essentially, they are either forgiven or they're not forgiven. That's the word retained. Father, thank you for the word of God. Again, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things from your word. Make the book come alive to us. It is alive. It is breathing. It's your word. It is God-breathed. But I pray that it would touch our hearts. Use the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, and your word to challenge us, change us, and encourage us. Transform us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just been looking at this passage quite a bit, and you'll notice there was a lot of confusion among the disciples. Looking earlier in the chapter, uh, you see that Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. She was confused. And you just read through. Uh, earlier in that chapter, and you find again confusion, and she's confronted by the angels. But the disciples, it's, this is in the evening of that first day of the week, in verse 19, and they're gathered together. They're grouped together in the midst. They're fearful. Why are they fearful? Well, the scripture goes on to say the doors were locked, and they were afraid because of the Jews. Because of the Jews. And then Jesus came and he stood among them and said, Peace to you. They needed a meeting with the Master. I venture to say that you and I need a meeting with the Master. He's revealed himself to us. We have the scriptures that convey to us that he's already come. History shows it, there's evidence. We have the scriptures, we have the Word of God. We had the complete scriptures. They did not, 
They were confused, even though he told them in advance, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for your sin. I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to rise again. But it's still confusing to them. And it didn't change their lives. So, <laughs> Wearsby states, locked doors will not give you peace. But it also won't keep out your loving Savior. Locked doors will not give you peace, but it also will not keep out your loving Savior. I am thankful that even though we have challenges in our lives, we face so many struggles, it doesn't keep Jesus out. Now, the disciples knew the Lord Jesus, but they were lacking in knowledge and they were lacking in the peace of God. You ever feel locked out from his presence? You ever feel like you're discouraged? You ever feel like you're missing out on the peace of God? You ever feel like you're in a battle with the Lord and you just desperately need Jesus? You need him to come in and do what only he can do. Jesus came and he stood in the midst of them. Hmm. In order to experience this peace, this peace with God, it first begins with peace of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, if you turn there to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verse 1. I've heard people talk about peace in so many different levels. We cannot find real peace unless that peace begins with Jesus Christ. It begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. These disciples, I think, would have first begun to realize something when Christ was risen from the dead, that that peace, well, let me share with Romans 5 first, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no peace apart through what he has done for us. And what he's done for us, I think they would have noticed as you go back to John 20. He talks about showing them his hands and his side. They needed living proof that he was alive. Hmm. I know you're wondering what in the world is going on up here, right? Hmm. I have never felt so blocked in all, well, I can't say in all my life. Hmm. Maybe I need to change gears. I have preached this message once or twice before been combing myself over with this message, reading it over and over again. Don't know why I'm struggling with this. No. I've experienced the peace of God in my life when I first came to faith. Um, there was an overwhelming sense of his peace. Over the last number of months, I've felt like I have walked in the Spirit like never before. But over the last few weeks, maybe a little longer, it's been more of a challenge. 
and I don't know why. To my knowledge, there is no unconfessed sin. And I don't want to make this about me, but I obviously, I can't even. Hmm. I'm having a hard time preaching this, and I don't know why. I got all the notes right in front of me. I've studied it. You ever feel blocked in your life? Have you done everything you can? And you just have some moments where you just feel this pressure, you feel this discouragement, this frustration. Maybe you don't. And I'm not saying that everybody should be experiencing this. But there are periods in my life, I don't know about you, where I feel like I'm doing all that I can do. Maybe that's part of the problem. I'm doing all that I can do, and unintentionally my focus is on me. Uh. Over and over again throughout the scripture, there is no way we're going to experience any peace apart from Christ. The disciples realized that. It all began on the cross. If you go to the Old Testament, they would have sacrifices, and they, that animal represented them. That animal was taking my place. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, right? There's no forgiveness of sin. Who came and made the ultimate sacrifice, folks? Jesus. Jesus came and made the ultimate sacrifice. I think they would have recognized that and realized that when they saw what Christ had done for them on the cross, and now he's actually alive. So that's where it begins. And for those that may not have a relationship with Christ, it begins with what he's done for us on Calvary. And that's where the real peace begins. Ephesians chapter 2, let me read this. When I first read that, it's, it's so simple and yet so encouraging. Ephesians 2, I think it's 13 and 14. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Aren't you glad that we have been brought near? I was once lost, but now I've been found. Blind is all get out. And I still need him. Even though I'm saved, we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he goes on because he is, verse 14, he is our peace. Christ is our peace. In verse 17, when Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. True peace comes through Christ's sacrifice, his shedding of his blood, his death, burial, and resurrection, and then you taking provision of it. I did that at 15 years of age. If you have not trusted in Christ, that's where real peace begins. But as believers, sometimes our peace is still robbed, isn't it? It's not because of anything that he has done. It's because I get in the way. It's maybe because I don't believe his word. Or maybe just in the humanness and the frailty of our lives, as already shown, my weakness and my frailty. <laughs> um, I would not say I've ever been the greatest of preachers. I know that. But I don't know I've ever had a stumbling block like that before. I don't like it. But the older I get, the more I realize how weak I am and how much I need him and need to be dependent upon him. It's not based on my performance, and I'm wrestling with that. I still wrestle with that at 59 years of age, soon to be 60. Can't believe it. Yes, young people, I am getting old. <laughs> You're saying, what are you doing with your phone out? That is the weirdest thing, Pastor Kirk. Well, I don't know. Maybe you'll resonate with this I got from a friend about struggles that we face in life. I wasn't going to read it, but I think I will. But let me just say this in case I don't say anything else. I want, I want you to get, this is what's most important is right here, the Word of God. I so appreciate Pastor Dave week after week after week faithfully proclaiming the exposition of God's Word, teaching in the midst of the preaching. Peace. They had a meeting with the Master that transformed their lives. Because 
What's impossible can become possible in Christ when you meet with a master. Jesus came on the scene. The doors were locked. He approached them. I'm so thankful that he initiates the action in our lives, aren't you? He came from heaven to earth so that you and I could have a relationship with him. Is there anything more important than that? That's where it begins, in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But then beyond that, we keep growing. But we face these challenges. And so he offers peace. He speaks peace to them. Here's your outline, if you want an outline. At least you'll have something you can look at later. And maybe you'll get even more out of it than what I just gave you. But peace, purpose. He gave them a purpose, right? Which is the great commission to send. He said, as I was sent out by the Father, so I'm sending you. So his peace, his purpose, and his power to fulfill that purpose. Because you and I cannot, nor will we ever fulfill the purpose of proclaiming the good news, being the witness that he wants us to be, living out the gospel in our lives the way that he desires without the power of the Holy Spirit because he said he breathed on them, the Holy Spirit, right? This is what my friend wrote. Where would I be without the new life that I get to live in Christ? It's honestly hard to imagine. I'll be real though. I think what saddens me the most about myself and other Christ followers is when we fail to step into the reality of our new future, our new mercies, our new grace, and new life in Christ every single day. Has anybody ever failed to step out in, into that and enjoy him? As John Piper says, glorify God and enjoy him forever. Are you enjoying him? Or have you been guilty of enjoying other things more than him? I'm not saying we can't enjoy things. He's given us many gifts, family, many things to enjoy, gifts of God, but not at the expense of enjoying who first and foremost? Him. We fail to enjoy his new grace, his new mercies. Do you remember when he first transformed your heart? It was so fresh that it felt like your eyes had been opened for the first time. Everything felt new, looked new, was full of new joy in life. But over time, after that initial life change took place, perhaps you began to lose that fiery passion and zeal that you once had. Maybe it returns at times, but you wish you could experience that first moment of salvation again, where it all went wrong for me, he said. And I'll tell you, what I'm about to say is countercultural. Is when I started to put the pressure of my new future and my calling onto myself. What if I don't get this new future right? What if I don't live out my calling? I've had people ask me that, by the way, even before they came to faith. I think they were on the brink of coming to faith in Christ. What if I can't, what if I don't honor him? All those things. What if I don't commit my time? Or what if I do commit my time to the wrong thing? What if I don't serve enough? What if I take it for granted? I immediately made it about me. I moved on from the free gift of being made new and straight to prioritizing what I could do for God instead of prioritizing being with God. I don't want to take up any more time reading that, but it's some good stuff. And, I, and you might say, well, I thought we we're supposed to do something for God and serve God, aren't we? Aren't we supposed to be ambassadors for God? Yes. But not at the expense of, first and foremost, spending time being with God. Because the more that I grow in him and spend time with him, and you see that all throughout scriptures, he comes to us. He initiates it. Even in Luke 24. I see that in Luke 24. They were discouraged. He had died and they thought it was all over. We've talked about this before probably. They're sad. There's two on the road to Emmaus. There's so much confusion. It's remarkable to me how Jesus makes all these appearances to so many people. The varieties of personalities and temperaments. Mary is so emotional. Jesus, where are you? She goes to the grave, but she loves him with all her heart. Peter, he's the penitent one. He ends up crying tears of, of great sorrow after failing the Lord. Two disciples on the Emmaus Road, Thomas the doubter, and Jesus shows up in the midst of all of them. But in Luke 24, he tells them how slow of heart you were to believe. And he walks with them along the way and opens the scriptures to them. 
We need to be in the scriptures. We need to be with God. That's how we be with God. How do you spend time with God? How do you get to know him and love him more? And the more you get to know him and love him more, and I need this, just let him assure you. Let him fill you with his spirit. Let him give you that peace as you spend time with him. What did they do? They heard the word of God as they walked along the road in Luke 24. It says in verse 27, beginning with, with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going. He gave the impression that he was going further because they'd been on a seven-mile walk with these two, Jesus and the two disciples. It says, but they urged him, Jesus, stay with us. Stay with us because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. They so enjoyed Jesus' presence, being with Jesus. You know, Jesus knew this was going to happen. He's sovereign. But I think he waits for us to invite him. Do you really want to know him and love him and to grow in him and to sense his love for you and to appreciate his love? They said, stay with us, because it's almost evening. They wanted more of Jesus. They wanted to hear more of his teaching. And so what did he do? He went in to stay with them. Why wouldn't he? He wants them to sense his love and to know of his plan for them all the more. I love that. And as you read on Luke 24, it talks more about the gospel that he shares with the disciples. Again, he shows up to them. He shows up on a regular basis. They're discouraged. They're fearful. They're, they're behind locked doors. They're closed up together. Fearful. How does he get in? How did he get in? The doors are locked. He's not there, and now all of a sudden, he's there. Because, obviously, he's God. And after the resurrection, he has that kind of a body. We don't have that kind of a body. We can't walk through locked doors. One day we'll have a resurrection body. Maybe we'll be able to do the same thing, but that's not the point. The point is that Jesus shows up again in a miraculous way, and he offers peace, he says to them. Peace. Hmm. As his children, I think they appreciated that and recognized that the sacrifice that he made. That's where it really begins. A peace is shalom. It's a secu it secures composure in difficult times. Anybody need composure? Anybody need stability and strength from the Lord? That inner strength when you go through difficult challenges? I need that peace too. That peace comes from Jesus. And he breathes on them and he says, he just says peace, speaks peace to them. Twice he speaks peace to them. Romans 14, 17 says this, the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is about, folks. It's not primarily about all the things. Think about the things that we do throughout the day and throughout the week. I'm not saying we shouldn't be busy. God has given us a plan. He's given us a purpose, and he talks about that purpose. But first and foremost, it's about his plan and his purpose but we need to experience his peace and his presence. Philippians 4, 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I need that from the attacks of the evil one. When fear comes in, we sang about it. His peace envelops us. He sees us through it. Even through the times that we just can't under explain, the dark nights of the soul, the frustrating moments that I even experienced this morning and that you had to sit through. Jesus will see us through one day at a time, one moment at a time. I need that. I need him. I'm glad he breaks through, even when I don't understand Locked doors, locked hearts, broken hearts. You can't keep them out. Hmm. He speaks peace. He establishes a purpose. What's his purpose? As the Father sent me, so I send you. 
He's commissioning them. It's not about a country club of just coming together and just it's all about just me and me, myself, and I. It's a rescue mission, verse 21. Luke 24 talks about it. I'm coming back to Luke 24. After the disciples saw Jesus and he said, do you have any bread to eat? Again, he's just reestablishing, here I am, I'm alive, folks. I'm alive, it's me. It says in verse 44, these are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. I told you all these things would occur from beginning in the Old Testament all the way up to now. God's word has been fulfilled. And it is good for today. It's relevant for today. Romans 15, 4 says this, for whatever was written before, whatever was written before was written for our instruction so that through our endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. That's why I need to be in the scriptures and you do too, Christian. We get hope. We get encouraged as we spend time in the word. And he goes on, he says in verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. <laughs> That's why I often pray, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful truths, wonderful things from your word. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I often hear another pastor pray this prayer, Lord, make the book live to me. Open my eyes, David said in the Psalms, that I may behold Wonderful. It takes the Spirit of God to understand the Word of God. And so, and he said this is what was written. Here it is, the gospel. We were sent out for the rescue mission. This is what he wrote. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead. This is Luke 24, 46. He would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. And it goes on. And then he said, and I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. You have a purpose. Our purpose is to make disciples, Matthew 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. How are we doing, folks? When we begin to obey him, when we, begin, when we spend time with him, when we experience his peace, we let him come in and continue to grow us up. We experience a transformation in our lives. We experience that assurance and the peace of God. And the love of Christ begins to grow in your hearts. You can't help. You're compelled. You will know the purpose. You will desire to fulfill that purpose to share Christ. It is a rescue mission. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. Are we going out in the midst in our world? In all that we do, in our activities, are we sharing Jesus? Are we looking to build relationships with folks and to present Christ to them? Peace, purpose, and you can't do it without his power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, part of the, the gospel, part of what might be confusing to you, verse 23, it says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain or don't forgive the sins of any, they are not retained. That might sound pretty strange to you. It may not make sense. And I've had some people, I've got an individual at work who has um, a Catholic background. And, and I have some friends who Catholic who put trusted in Christ as Savior. But the actual teaching uh, is a problem. There is no priest. There is no pastor that can forgive sins. And it might appear that way from that scripture. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive the sins of some, they are not forgiven. Listen, there is nobody who can withhold sin or withhold forgiveness. There's only one person who can forgive. What it's basically saying is this. By the authority of Christ and his word, as the disciples and as you proclaim the good news with somebody of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, if you proclaim that gospel and somebody, the hearer, receives it, they will be forgiven. That's all it's saying. If when you proclaim the good news, which we are to do, to share the good news with an unbeliever, and they choose to reject it, then what? They will not be forgiven. 
It has nothing to do with my power or a priest's power or anybody else. All we do is present the gospel, and it's their response and the Spirit of God, what he does in their hearts and their lives. That's all that's essentially saying. Are you experiencing his peace? Do you know his purpose? And are you experiencing his power? He said, I will give you, I will breathe on you the Holy Spirit. That's also interesting because um, I suppose he can do anything. He's Jesus. He's God. I not suppose. I know he can. But I think this is a picture of what's to come. Because a little later he had said in the scriptures, wait in Jerusalem until I send you the promise of who, folks? Of who? The Holy Spirit. And, it, and he comes. I think it's like maybe Acts chapter 1. And so he promises them the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, actually, is when the church is birthed and all are filled with the Holy Spirit. And after that point in time, you begin to see a transformation of lives. And when the gospel is presented, many people come to faith in Christ. So you can't live this life. We can't be living and loving the Lord Jesus and proclaiming the gospel, being the witnesses that he wants us to be apart from the Holy Spirit. We need him desperately in our lives. How you doing? How you doing? If you're a believer, are you more fearful, fearful about the opposition? Are you more fearful about what somebody might say? Just think about your own heart, your own motives. Or are you more confident in the gospel that Jesus said, I've given you this gospel I have called you, I've commissioned you, I've given you my spirit. Do you have confidence in the gospel, folks? Does the gospel mean more to you today than it did yesterday? I hope it does. I am trying to grow more in my love for Christ, to hear from his word, to love the gospel, and to live the gospel, and to share it. We need a confidence in the gospel of Christ. It's not, as Pastor Dave said last week, I love what he said. It's Christ plus nothing that equals everything. And Christ gives us the gospel. It's his death, burial, and resurrection. It's all right here in the scriptures. We don't need anything else. That doesn't mean we can't pursue other objectives to help in our world <laughs> as good citizens of this world, but the only thing that saves is Jesus Christ. And unbelievers, how you doing? If you don't know Christ... There is no peace. There is no peace unless you know Christ, the Savior. In order to have the peace of God, we need to have the peace with God. Father God, we desperately need you. I desperately need you. Lord, I pray that each of us here today would experience the peace of God Thank you that you've come into our lives, you broke into our lives some not long ago, for others maybe many years ago. Wherever we are, I, I pray that that love relationship with you would go deeper. Make this book come alive in our own hearts. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us, to encourage us, to fill us that we would experience the fruit of the Spirit to be the witness that this world needs to see. And Lord, no matter what takes place in our lives, no matter what challenges we face, I thank you that you break through. You continue to give us the strength to go, take one step, put one foot in front of the other, to walk in obedience to you. So Lord, help us no matter what we feel, no matter where we are in our emotions, May we continue to walk in obedience to you. We just surrender to you. Break into our lives. Reveal to us what we need to see. Teach us, Father, your word. May we experience your peace. May we begin to live of the gospel in even greater ways. And as believers, help us to proclaim the gospel to those, Father, in our lives, co-workers, family members, friends who don't know Christ. Please, Father, give us a love for you first and foremost and a love for them. For those who don't know Jesus, God, I pray that uh, 
they would look to you, the one who offers forgiveness of sin. If there's someone who's walked in today, Lord God, I pray that they would surrender their lives to you and know that you died for them. They could have all their sins forgiven if they'd only place their faith and trust in you. I pray that today would be that day, that they would experience new life in Christ. Father, we'll give you all the praise for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.